Hello everybody and welcome to Blue Marble Science. The Cavendish Experiment. I know many of you have heard of the Cavendish Experiment and know of it, but what was it really? And who was Henry Cavendish? Well, Cavendish was an English natural philosopher and a scientist. He lived in the 1700s and early 1800s. He was a fellow of the Royal Society of London and he's most famous for a couple of things. One, the discovery of the element hydrogen, but maybe much more importantly, his work in determining the density of the Earth. This experiment has always fascinated me. The fact that Henry Cavendish could conduct this experiment in the late 1700s and determine the density of the Earth, hence the mass of the Earth, and if you just take one more small step, you have the universal gravitational constant. And Cavendish was able to arrive at a value that was within 1% of the accepted value we use today. Now, I can describe the experiment in my words, but I think Cavendish did such a wonderful job in the paper that he published, we should probably just read his words. The title of the paper is Experiments to Determine the Density of the Earth by Henry Cavendish, Esquire, Fellow of the Royal Society, and A.S. Now, I've talked to a number of people, and we've yet to understand what A.S. really means. Maybe one of you can help us out. But this paper was read at the Royal Society on June the 21st, 1798. Many years ago, the late Reverend John Michel of this society contrived a method of determining the density of the earth by rendering sensible the attraction of small quantities of matter. But as he was engaged in other pursuits, he did not complete the apparatus till a short time before his death and did not live to make any experiments with it. After his death, the apparatus came to Reverend Francis John Hyde Wollaston, Jacksonian professor at Cambridge, who, not having conveniences for making experiments with it in the manner he could wish, was so good as to give it to me. The apparatus is very simple. It consists of a wooden arm six feet long, made so as to unite great strength with little weight. The arm is suspended in a horizontal position by a slender wire 40 inches long, and to each extremity is hung a leaden ball about two inches in diameter. The hole is enclosed in a narrow wooden case to defend it from the wind. As no more force is required to make this arm turn round on its center than what is necessary to twist the suspending wire, it is plain that if the wire is sufficiently slender, the most minute force, such as the attraction of a leaden weight a few inches in diameter, will be sufficient to draw the arm sensibly aside. The weights which Mr. Michel intended to use were eight inches diameter. One of these was to be placed on one side of the case opposite to one of the balls and as near as it could conveniently be done and the other on the other side opposite to the other ball so that the attraction of both of these weights would conspire in drawing the arm aside. And when its position as affected by these weights was ascertained the weights were to be removed to the other side of the case so as to draw the arm the contrary way. And the position of the arm was to be again determined. And consequently, half the difference of these positions would show how much the arm was drawn aside by the attraction of the weights. In order to determine from hence the density of the earth, it is necessary to ascertain what force is required to draw the arm aside through a given space. This Mr. Michel intended to do by putting the arm in motion and observing the time of its vibrations from which it may easily be computed. Now there's a footnote that says Mr. Coulomb has, in a variety of cases, used a contrivance of this kind for trying small attractions. But Mr. Michel informed me of his intention of making this experiment and of the method he intended to use before the publication of any of Mr. Coulomb's experiments. Mr. Michel had prepared two wooden stands on which the leaden weights were to be supported and pushed forward till they came almost in contact with the case, but he seems to have intended to move them by hand. As the force with which these balls are attracted by these weights 
is excessively minute, not more than one fifty millionth of their weight, it is plain that a very minute disturbing force will be sufficient to destroy the success of the experiment. And from the following experiments it will appear that the disturbing force most difficult to guard against is that arising from the variations of heat and cold. For if one side of the case is warmer than the other, the air in contact with it will be rarefied and in consequence will ascend while that on the other side will descend and produce a current which will draw the arm sensibly aside. As I was convinced of the necessity of guarding against this source of error, I resolved to place the apparatus in a room which should remain constantly shut and to observe the motion of the arm from without by means of a telescope and to suspend the leaden weights in a manner that I could move them without entering the room. This difference in the manner of observing rendered the necessity to make some alteration to Mr. Michel's apparatus. And as there were some parts of it which I thought not so convenient as could be wished, I chose to make the greatest part of it afresh. Cavendish continues in a great deal of detail, and you'll find a link to this entire paper in the description. Let's take a look at what the experiment actually looked like. The room Cavendish talked about is shown here. There are the walls and the roof of the room, and this is to prevent rapid changes in temperature, which Cavendish thought would be the greatest source of error. The actual apparatus is this wooden enclosure inside the box, and inside the enclosure is the torsion beam, a very slender wooden rod at the bottom, hanging from a torsion wire that you see there, and that torsion wire can be twisted or moved to adjust its position from the outside of the room. The small masses are suspended from both ends of the beam and cavities at each end of the apparatus. The large masses hang from a beam at the top which can be rotated from the outside. That eliminated Cavendish needing to go inside the room to change the position of the large weights. On both sides of the room, Cavendish had telescopes, and those telescopes were designed to look through small windows in both ends of the apparatus at a vernier, which is the way Cavendish made the measurements. And all of that was illuminated by lanterns just above each of the telescopes. Now looking at a top view of the apparatus, you see again the enclosure and the small masses that are suspended from the torsion beam at each end. The large masses are also suspended from a beam that can rotate, and in the position that you see them currently, the large masses are attracting the small masses and causing the torsion beam to twist in a counterclockwise direction. When those masses are moved, the large masses, if they rotate to that position, now they attract the opposite sides of the small masses, and now the torsion beam wants to twist in a clockwise direction. It's a very simple process, and this is an experiment that's repeated hundreds and hundreds of times every year in universities all over the world. I want to try to replicate this experiment as closely as possible to what Cavendish did originally. Now some of that is not totally practical because Cavendish used extremely large masses. He used 350 pound masses for his large mass. And that's just beyond my capability of being able to handle it. But I think I can handle something on the order of say 75 pounds. I think we can build a test apparatus that is very similar to the one Cavendish used. And I think we should do that. I think we can perform the test exactly the way Cavendish performed his tests. We might cheat a little bit and add a laser just to verify the accuracy of our manual measurements, but I think using the method that Cavendish used, we should be able to obtain results that are similar in accuracy. Now the beauty of the Cavendish experiment is simply this. It confirms that Sir Isaac Newton was absolutely correct. Mass does actually attract other mass. And if we take it just a little bit further, we can easily calculate the universal gravitational constant. 
I think this is a great opportunity for us to go through the intricacies of designing and performing a test like this. There's a lot more to it than simply floating an egg in salt water and then making measurements that you don't understand. I really think this is going to be a lot of fun. Hey, thanks for watching. And stay tuned, folks. We're going to get into the details. Hey, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons down there. There's a link to the Patreon, but in the weeks to come, I'll tell you some ways that you can help support this effort. Until then, you guys take care and I'll catch you on the next one.